I got out of my truck. Were you thrown out of it? No. Now, how many of them? Two. What were they wearing? A jumpsuit, kind of a green jumpsuit, and a, a peacock blue jumpsuit, cowboy what, boots. What exactly did they uh, say when they came in the store? They said, uh, uh, get down off the ladder, this is it. Do you think they were for real? I didn't think they were for real at first, but I soon learned that they were. Both doors were wedged, and I managed to kick one of them open and get out. The gas or fumes were running down under me there then, catching a fire under was me. Was there applause before there was an explosion? No. When I first noticed it, there was flames in. When it, when it hit, it broke into flames right then. Both management and the union have uh, come to the determination that they need to build cars and our people need to work. And uh, I think both sides have a have taken a better look at their individual positions and probably uh, the remaining issues will be able to re be resolved in a peaceful uh, negotiation. We certainly hope so. We're going to endeavor to do our part to continue on a peaceful basis. That's why we didn't have Mars yesterday. The folks cut a tape and put it on both the black radio stations and said there was no reason to march yesterday. Well, I think everybody here now knows that's a lie. Right on. Right on. Right on. You know what's causing the hate? You know what's causing the all the hurting that's going on inside of all of us and among us. Lord, we want you. Syria of the Vietnam veterans to reelect the president. Southeast Asia issue is uh, is comparable and equal to his particular issue. And again, this is my particular feeling. ...views on the national political scene. President Nixon has worked diligently... ...veterans organizations. Not that we're a complete right-wing American Legion. Uh, I'm very actively with these... ...to understand some of the war sentiment that uh, some of these protesters have. I did not agree at all the times, but um, I, did, I did understand on the side. I want you to sit down here so you'll be close by for the status report, okay? Uh, 
you'll have a little difficulty there. Yeah. Concern in placing a veteran. He has done as much in leg work and planning as anyone I've ever seen in order to seminars to uh, better inform the veterans of their benefits and the industry. Um, I'll go. Uh, city evening, the city at the hall, or city hall. The, the city hall, city. Places, yeah. Jones. How many more have not been placed? Well, I, I think presently that we have the record. Well, I think uh, regardless of what the president's promise was four years ago, we have a situation now. Uh, we have people that are in trouble that we've, we've committed ourselves to, and uh, we can't uh, yank support out of them just because of uh, something that, that has been said four years ago. The mayor held a small conference at City Hall to praise the results of a special task force appointed last February to work on placing veterans in jobs. Stovall said a great deal of work has been done for vets, especially those returning from Vietnam, without much fanfare or publicity. I think it is particularly noteworthy that we in Fort Worth have surpassed the national average and averages of, of other comparable cities by placing more than 30 percent of the veterans seeking employment, and since the organization of the mayor's task force for the employment of, of veterans, February of 1972, a total of 2,900 veterans have been placed in jobs. The chairman of the task force, John McKissick, said the national average of placing veterans in jobs is about 27 percent. Fort Worth's average is 34 percent. Herman Foster, the Veterans Employment Program Coordinator, says there are still 5,300 veterans in Fort Worth who need jobs and asks for your help by calling the Texas Employment Commission the National Alliance of Businessmen, or the American Legion. Jim Green, Channel 8 News on the Move in Fort Worth. It's going to take the... this business of a possible ceasefire and a national election to, to possibly follow such a ceasefire. And this is what I'd like to talk to you about. I first came to Dallas Paris, 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 this place. Well, I go back. I'm a Parisian, so I, I can say.
And a commercial record. Yes. Would you like a citation? Mr. Keats, how would you phrase the philosophy of the of the Keats? According to the Texas Department of Public Safety, 91 school children were injured on buses similar to this in Texas last year, and one child was killed. A Contact 8 viewer from Arlington, Mike Noel, feels injuries would have been fewer if children didn't have to stand while riding school buses. I asked Mike Cope, who is the Director of Transportation for the Arlington School District, how strict Texas busing regulations really are. Well, the state law says that uh a bus can carry a, to a total of 96 students. Now this means uh, three students to a seat and one standing for each seat on the bus. Let me uh, insert here now that uh, we do not tell a bus driver to go out and pick up, go out here and find 96 students and come back with them. Uh, we would like to have all of our students seated if possible, but uh, sometimes in different areas we cannot. And do you personally think that Texas bus regulations should be changed? I think that it probably needs to be altered some. I don't know whether we need to drop down to the 72 uh, mark or not. With uh, three people per seat, uh, we probably need to drop down to 85 or 82 and put our seat in here instead of the 96 mark. The Department of Public Safety did have this good news for concerned parents. Texas bus regulations will be changed probably during the next regular session of the Texas State Legislature. Texas law will be rewritten to comply with new federal standards which call for the seating of all students riding school buses. If you have any problems or questions, please write me at Contact 8, Communication Center Dallas. That's Contact 8. I'm Cecile Durant.
Mrs. Ann Armstrong, the first co-chairman of the Republican National Committee, is touring the country. She's going by this bus to something like 45 cities in 13 states. Let's find out uh, what kind of people are attending this rally today. Talk to a few if we can. You are uh, apparently a uh, Nixon Agnew supporter in your presence today. Yes, I am. Do you think this type of activity is going to uh, pay off? I think it will. Uh, the buses came, I think, from Wichita Falls and you know, taking a tour throughout the nation. I think it will help out a whole lot. What is your name? My name is Cletus Millsap, and I'm from Garland. Thank you, Cletus. All right, let's move on in. I understand there are a lot of the uh, candidates here today. Dr. Uh, Marvin Berkeley is in the crowd. Dr. Berkeley, how are you? Good to see you this morning. Good to be with you. Well, thank you. Do you think this kind of activity is going to pay off for Nixon Agnew? Oh, it can't help but help. Of course. Surely. We all hope so. Thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, let's see. Well, here's Fred Agnich. Good morning. Uh, Fred, speak to your public. You've just been speaking to uh, this group. Uh, do you think these type of rallies are going to pay off for the Nixon Agnew ticket? Oh, I think they are. I think uh, that primarily they, they show the amount of enthusiasm that we have in all of our volunteer workers. I think it's a great thing to spur them on in these last two weeks so that we can go on to victory. Thank you very much, Fred. Oh, boy. This is a new congressional team that you're going to send to Washington, D.C. Okay. Now, there's a great team. Jim Collins, please show the way. Jim, now don't go away because I want to introduce you first. So complete with Mariachi Band, direct from Mexico City, and the leader of the Mexican-American community for Nixon Agnew. This machine leaves Dallas today, goes to Fort Worth, and then continues on its merry way. They've got an app name for it. It's called the Simply Amazing Three-Dimensional Two-Tone Transcontinental Nixon Agnew New Majority People Machine. If that's not enough title, then we we'll have to work on it. This is Jim Mitchell, Channel 8 News on the Move. No, I can't give you any detail uh, about it, but uh, as you know, you are very much interested in it. <coughs> of course, uh, we are obliged to show some uh, discretion, and uh, we, we never wanted to interfere into the substance of the negotiations, but uh, we are the host of uh, the Paris talks, official or secret. And, uh, we favor any move which could lead to a peaceful settlement. So uh, we are ready to do our utmost uh, to favor such a settlement. For example, you notice the fish in here tend to uh, associate very closely with the solid structures, the uh -huh. corals. And this is very true in a kelp bed also, the solid structures, the forest-like environment that the, these underwater trees provide attract a great many fishes. They seek protection and security. So in net effect, we could be harvesting not only uh, kelp, but fish as well, if the forests were left alone and not destroyed. This by is the what actually happens, yes. The kelp beds are the rich fishing areas of our coast. Am I going to ever want to eat kelp? Oh, you've eaten kelp probably three or four times today. Oh, yeah. And the, they process a very uh, wonderful, uh, versatile chemical from it called algin, A-L-G-I-N. This is used in such varied things as salad dressings, toothpaste, uh, ice cream, beer. When you think of Dallas dailies, the Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Times Herald immediately come to mind. But how many of you recognize the third daily newspaper, the Daily Commercial Record? Well, it happens to be one of Texas' oldest newspapers, continuously owned and operated by the same family, now in its fourth generation and going strong. The commercial record reports all the legal transactions within the county on a daily basis. 
The publisher is Mrs. E. Newell Cates, whose family started the paper back in 1888. Mr. Cates is the editor of the newspaper, and to prove it's still a family operation, their son, E. Newell Cates, Jr., is assistant editor. There are a number of contributing reporters, but the granddaddy of them all is a longtime Dallas newsman, Bert Haling, who was continuity and publicity director here at WFAA from 1934 to 1936. Mr. Cates has a philosophy about his daily commercial record. Well, we'll take it back to the uh, time of in the European uh, countries uh, where they had the town crier uh, giving the news and then on down to where they would post the legal uh, uh, aspects of the court uh, for the people to read or to be read aloud to the people. So you liken the, uh, the commercial record to that? Right. Uh, the people have to know what's going on uh, as far as their courts are concerned, uh, their laws, and that type of thing. I'm interested in what makes a man and his family devote their their lives, if you will, uh, to this type of operation. I guess the old adage, the show must go on, and we must produce each day a, a newspaper. Uh, we're, well, it's hard to define, really. Uh, we're just so involved with it uh, that it's a part of our life. So anyway, here you have it, three of America's most vital components. You have the family business, you have the small business, and most certainly you have the free enterprise system. Yes, the daily commercial record is alive and well, and it's living right here in the heart of downtown Dallas. This is Jim Mitchell, Channel 8 News on the Move. We're doing the best that we can. Uh, this latest uh, shooting occurred tonight. It's now in the process of being investigated. As soon as it's being, in, as soon as the investigation is complete, we will make known the results, and uh, I hope that that will be satisfactory. But uh, I don't know because it seems like there's a move on now to get nightly, nightly marches. Uh, why? We don't know unless someone will sit down and talk with us about it. What's your full jump? 